Hi, everyone, and welcome to our fourth episode of Better Together. Today, we have with us Christian Hestag, who is the head of the IoT and hardware program at Startup Lab. In case you're new to Crowdcast, there's a comment section on the right and the ask a question button on the bottom. So if you have any questions or there's something you're curious about, just ask away and we're going to take your questions as we go along. And today our topic in broad sense is talking about being made in Norway, production in Norway, as the pandemic is continuing and it started a lot of companies were left in a vulnerable position. And so we're trying to see are there options and benefits to maybe changing that and bringing that around into our own countries and talking about local produce and local production. So welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Pleasure, pleasure. Um, if you could just start off by introducing yourself and a little bit about what you do and Hardware Lab, actually. Yeah, well, well I'm Kristen. Um, so basically the hardware and IoT program uh, is a virtual uh, network and a physical lab here at uh, uh, Oslo Science Park. Um, what we basically do is that we connect people. That's broad sense our job. So in the virtual network, we have uh, electronics manufacturers out of Norway. We have component suppliers. We have uh, startups. We have engineers, uh, experts in various areas. Uh, and we kind of connect these people. So let's say a startup want to make a physical product. Uh, we connect them with someone that will fit making that physical product. Uh, and uh, fortunately, the, these people actually uh, around Norway, there's more electronics manufacturers that, than people actually know. <laughs> Most people think that everything is made in China, but it's not. Um, so we try to put people together with uh, manufacturers that's, that are close to them. That means that um, when they try to produce some, want to produce something, it's a short way, uh, maybe just one hour, two hours drive, uh, and they can discuss with the, actually the, the factory itself, instead of flying off to China, uh, back and forth. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so I'm, I'm guessing like this is a really kind of um, great way of helping uh, these startups and kind of like ensuring their success that everything is compact is it kind of a struggle usually uh when they need to travel so far or yeah well, it depends on the product you want to make mm. uh, basically um if your goal is to make a consumer your end consumer product um uh, in the millions uh, it might be good just traveling to china <laughs> first but uh, if you want to do a first small series, mm -hmm. uh, high quality, uh, and be sure that your product will work, uh, it could be very beneficial uh, using a local manufacturer. Yeah. Um, just kind of, why wouldn't perhaps you do the whole series? Uh, what, what, are, what are the barriers in cost. there? Cost. Basically, yeah. the cost. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but Let's say you got a, you're a fresh uh, company, you have never made a physical product before. Maybe you went to school, learn a lot about it, but you have actually never done it in practice. Mm -hmm. um, then it's very nice to have somebody close to, close to you and can, you can discuss with the factory um, during your development. Yeah. So you don't do uh, errors that will impact the cost of uh, producing that product. Uh, for doing uh, errors in the design phase uh, could be very costly uh, and it might not even though be it might not be possible to actually produce it at high volume mm. so doing the your first series uh, in Norway uh, I think uh, is very beneficial for you because also as a startup uh, you have limited those founts right so uh, your first series uh, it kind of it doesn't doesn't have to it, don't, it must not fail so um for a startup that where your first series is failing that's uh, in many cases is the end of the company mm -hmm. so uh it could be much smarter to invest a little more in doing um onshore production and then offshoring when you're uh, when you're scaling up basically yeah um actually 
what is how does the typical kind of production process when you're making a hardware product how 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 is that uh, normally you have no ID <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of validate this ID to the market uh, just by doing simple simple prototypes you can do it with cardboard and pencils basically but just drawing your product and see if there's some some people interested in it mm -hmm. And then after that, you start making a prototype. Um, so here in uh, Oslo Science Park, we have a hardware lab uh, where you can do prototyping. That means that you can 3D print your housing. You can solder your own PCBs. You can like make your product so it um, uh, the function is, uh, is good on it. And then you can test it out on, on, uh, on users and do... Uh, yeah, do a lean method where you just uh, do over and over again and try to improve that until you have a product which you want to produce. Mm. Um, but a good thing about having this uh, hardware uh, network is that you have have the companies and the manufacturers mm. uh, in Norway which could actually come in and give you guidance in the start. Mm. So, so by when you get guidance, you uh, they will tell you that maybe you should do kind of tweak a bit on your box so it's easier to mold. Um, maybe you should um, change a bit on your PCB and some other components so it's cheaper to make. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, by having these uh, manufacturers in a network, you get a lot of free advice, actually. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Um, kind of just out of curiosity, um, I think when we think about Norway, Sometimes it can be a little bit unclear about what actually is produced in Norway. What what does Norway actually uh, produce? Well, Norway is kind of the whole oil and gas <laughs> industry has basically founded a lot of Norwegian sub suppliers. So um, the most things actually we do make in Norway is uh, high tech. Uh, high quality com uh, components for uh, the industry. Uh, so most of the things made in Norway is like maybe valves for the old oil industry, uh, pumps. Uh, uh, there's a huge, um, what do you call it, the military mm -hmm. industry uh, due to the Kongsberg uh, group. Uh, so a lot of the electronics uh, made in Norway is uh, military electronics or offshore electronics and a lot of those uh, kind of in especially in the offshore sector these products has um, gone over to the consumer market also so that means that uh, things like simrad uh, which makes radars and stuff like that for boats mm. and used to also does that for the military is now also making consumer products for the uh, yacht uh, industry Interesting. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, uh, because the company, like the production kind of things you've mentioned here, but like, for example, oil and gas, those are really yeah. super high tech and yeah. I don't know, luxury, perhaps in a normal consumer's eye, eyes. Uh, does this benchmark uh, a certain standard for what Norwegian production is seen as that, OK, we're in Norway, we only produce luxury products. Is that a thing? Does it benchmark that? I think uh, I think you, we won't say it, look at this as luxury products mm. because these things are valves, like valves for the whole industry. Yeah. Uh, you don't want a leakage on a wellhead, right? Mm. On uh, three thousand meters deep. <laughs> um, so uh, it's more like you do high quality stuff mm. um, where the standards needs to be met, right? Yeah. Um, and now we see that this, the same thing inside the medical technology. So Norway is producing uh, a lot of uh, medical high-tech uh, equipment. Um, and the, I think a lot of the manufacturers are kind of taking, taking their experience by do, with uh, quality insurance, with, uh, uh, with high-tech, uh, with uh, high-quality production into the medical tech technology production. So about 90% of the medical technology we produce, actually make in Norway, manufacture here in Norway, is exported. And it's exported to countries like the US and China. Uh, and in the medical world, the stamp made in Norway is a high quality sign. So it's, uh, it's like you're dealing with people, right? So uh, and it's, it's, you're dealing with li people's lives. So uh, uh, high quality has to be met. Yeah. 
And uh, how how do you experience that in terms of uh, does it? <laughs> Does it induce a little bit of pressure in, for example, consumer products that are being made in Norway or Norwegian companies that you've worked with that are trying to create products? Do, do it, Does it have a certain pressure that it asserts in that, okay, we're known for this, now we kind of have to live up to the standards? Of, of course, because I think people are used to that made in Norway, the stamp made in Norway mm -hmm. means that it's high quality. So if you're Suddenly, trying to produce a consumer electronics product product in Norway, and it's uh, the stamp has uh, made in Norway on it. Uh, people will es expect a higher quality, uh, but also that means that the price could be also be higher. So, uh, higher price, higher quality, mm. basically. So I don't. So then, yes, consumer products more luxury. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Actually. Is it possible to get like a full made in Norway stamp? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, I think inside mechanical products, uh, you could do that. Uh, but most electronics products, uh, I don't know if you have noticed, but a lot of um, uh, American products also, it says assembled in the US, mm -hmm. right? So it's assembled in Norway. Uh, it doesn't say manufactured. Um, and the reason for that is that the global supply chains, when it comes to electronics, um, like components which you use inside the electronics products uh, are made in China or in the, in the Far East, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, so it's, <laughs> it's very interconnected. So you cannot say that something is fully made in Norway, I think, not at least inside electronics. Yeah. Uh, because they have bought the components from a supplier in Asia, basically, yeah. and put it together in Norway. Hmm. And what kind of uh, challenges uh, does this uh, impose? Or well, you could say say now during the COVID nineteen situation, mm -hmm. it's uh, the supply chain has been cut basically. So uh, uh, we have a lot of companies. Uh, I think one company like AUK, uh, which are making this. Uh, home growing kit for uh, vegetables. You can do, uh, grow at home. Uh, a lot of those electronic components, which they need like the motors and so on inside there, they are made in China. Uh, so, uh, and suddenly nothing was made in China anymore. Uh, so that means that uh, uh, when the global supply chains get cut, um, then you, it's hard to make the product, assembler product here in Norway at least. And this is, but this is the same for every country in the world, basically. Yeah. Uh, it's nothing, it's very interconnected, the whole world now, because you make like, uh, also like China is also uh, reliant on the minerals uh, mined in Africa uh, for making their components, right? So everyone is kind of dependent on each other. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's a bad thing because it's uh, kind of opened up your eyes for the world. Yeah. And of course, people has been trading and every country has been trading with each other for hundreds of years. So it's just, uh, we're just taking up to the next scale, basically. Interesting. And um, I'm wondering what would encourage, let's say apart from costs, are there other factors that would make a company produce something in uh, maybe Norway or Europe as opposed to China or vice versa? Uh, I would think that let's say you're a Norwegian company and you're producing a, a consumer product that you want to sell in China, right? Uh, and you want to produce it in millions. Uh, then it's very beneficial finding a partner and a manufacturer and making this product in China because it's then it's like political, it's easier to get it out on the market. Mm -hmm. It's closer also to the dis distributors there. there. But um, uh, if you want to make something that you're selling in the Nordics uh, and it's uh, a, a smaller series, a smaller volume, um, then you can maybe want to make it in Norway or Sweden or Poland or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you want to make it close to home. But kind of depends on the product very much yeah and I'm just wondering does um, 
the place you make the product, does it end up affecting the retail price or how much you end up selling it for? Because uh, I think we kind of delved into this a little bit uh, yeah. earlier, as you said, uh, that uh, sometimes uh, having the stamp made in Ori means that the price can also be a little bit higher. Yeah. Does is this a part in it that because it's made here, therefore the price is higher, as opposed to if it's made in China, then the price will be lower, even if it's the same product? Absolutely. It's like mm, it's the wages are higher, um, so it's it's more expensive to make stuff here, no doubt. There's more expensive to make stuff in Norway, uh, yeah. but maybe that's okay for some kind of product, right? So some products. Uh, you want to have a higher quality. There's a smaller volume uh, and you can uh, take a higher price. That's no problem. And maybe you should also do that for your, like I said, for your first series to be like um, sure about its uh, its quality when you f sell your first series. Mm. So your first customers get a good ex experience. Uh, and then you maybe, and then also you get the experience of producing that product. So you can, maybe you can tweak on that product. Uh, how you produce it and then you can produce it in china yeah so yeah or some other eastern eastern europe uh, or um, or asian country yeah um uh i think we might have a question over here let's see um um what is um Okay, somebody's asking evan is asking what is the motivation of companies that provide free advice so i'm thinking he's uh, referring yeah. back to you the <laughs> well, network. of course their motivation is uh getting that uh, that client as a customer <laughs> that's their motivation of course mm. uh we have uh, a lot of uh, manufacturers here which we have in the network and they give free advice and the same does suppliers uh, because they see that in the end this could actually secure a contract uh, with the startup um so yeah it's business uh, that's how it is uh, <laughs> but of course it also has when you're growing um for some some companies uh their clients uh what their client is pr trying to produce is also very important for the future of the production company uh we have companies here in norway who are uh, are actively seeking producing high tech um uh, products uh, because when they have to produce high-tech uh, uh, products, they also have to uh, um, um, kind of uh, up their competence inside high-tech production. Mm -hmm. And that means when they have uh, made something that uh, they have they had to up their competence in production, the production line, they can show off this later and get new customers that's even more high-tech and high-tech. And kind of you build up on boxes, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, I think that's their motivation. Yeah. yeah. Did nothing uh, wrong with that. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, Sigurd is asking, do you have any examples of Norwegian startups making, assembling or manufacturing hardware in Norway? I think you mentioned out. Do you have? Yeah, we have a lot of them. Mm. Um, uh, we have like uh, AUK, uh, we have uh, No Isolation, if this, this company making the robot, which uh, you can have on the school if uh, or somewhere else mm. uh, if you have a long term ill uh, uh, classmate uh, you can have that uh, kind of see through that robot uh, with an ipad or a computer that's made in uh, tau at uh, west control in outside stavanger uh, we have the camera that's filming us right now yeah. <laughs> uh, hudley uh, used to be made in taiwan uh, they moved their production to hapu at hadlon uh, actually uh, making, uh, creating, uh, I think it's like 50 or 20 new jobs there. Um, we have, uh, yeah, we have a lot of uh, CIVID uh, made in Norway. Um, yeah. Yeah. Stop. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm just wondering, so for example, is there, do companies come into issues for example if they are producing things in china copying how how do they or what is the best way of companies kind of like securing their design is there a best way for them to secure their design be the fastest one <laughs> Could you tell me. us a little bit more about being fast <laughs> yeah so when you make something uh 
uh, it's like we we try to say that everyone has ideas, right? But it's few that actually can go through them. Um, so uh, uh, let's say I want to do a consumer product in China. Uh, you can bet that somebody will uh, spot your product and will uh, make a copy of it. But uh, if you're faster and you have a bigger distribution network, um, then you, you're you bound to win, basically. So uh, you need to kind of secure that distribution network, have everything ready so you can move fast. Uh, but that's in China. Uh, in Europe, uh, US, uh, patent stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but patenting can be take a very long time, so it kind of depends on the product again. Yeah. Like for high tech stuff, um, like the tunable uh, company here at Oslo Science Park making mm. gas analyzers, mm. you would patent uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, but maybe for a, a see that some game uh, consumer game uh, for kids in China. Yeah doesn't really matter. Um, And I think Al is asking, can patents be more uh, protected if if the protection is made in Norway? And how can, well, I kind of delved into the question. So are patents more protected if the Absolutely. Here in Norway, we have like a very strong protection of patents. Yeah, Mm. absolutely. So we have... uh, there's the patent office making sure that uh, people don't copy you have lawyers you have like the whole ecosystem around patents yeah uh, but that uh, in asia hasn't been like um, at least not in china has been it hasn't been a culture uh, it's more a culture of copying in uh, copying and maybe make it che- cheaper to produce yeah. uh, sometimes make it better <laughs> but kind of build up on other stuff but don't they don't really care about the patents now. But, yeah. but now uh, the later years, it's going to be, that's got more and more important also in China. So okay, it's, got, it's developing. I would. Yeah. I'm actually wondering kind of uh, copying kind of ha- d- in what ways uh, does it kind of help innovate? Does this help uh, people innovate like products a little bit more said a little bit but sometimes it can be improved on, does some it can be improved right so something you will say you will take a product and they will find out how can it do it uh, manufacture it faster and cheaper mm-hmm. doesn't mean that product gets more robust or, or it better um, better product but this gets it may be cheaper so more people are able to buy it right mm-hmm. um if you kind of, uh, you could uh, kind of uh, compare this with uh, it's comparable with medicine industry, mm-hmm. right? So
Vad är det för pack? Yeah, uh, sorry, I think we got uh, <laughs> taken offline there for a little bit. I'm not quite sure where this stopped, but we're just going to keep on continuing anyway, so we don't take out too much of your lunch hour. Um, actually, there are a lot of questions, so we're going to just hop on ahead with some of people's questions over here. Um, let's see. Marius is asking, is production in Norway sustainable if you want to make uh, products for markets abroad, thinking of the expenses involved? Yes, absolutely. Uh, again, depends on the product. <laughs> High quality products, uh, yes, absolutely, because people will pay, will pay them when they're made in, uh, when they're from Norway and that's a, a quality stamp, yeah. like the medical products. Uh, you also said the same, I think uh, you had the company called the Electro Company, which made like uh, uh, campfires. Uh, that's uh, super, super expensive and also super, super, super high quality. Uh, people bought them abroad, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it depends on the product. Um, uh, cheapo uh, consumer play product? No, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, high quality products, yes. Uh, also, products that's for the industry, mm. like uh, Rolls Royce, um, as factories in Norway, making engines, uh, turbine, turbines. Mm. Uh, so, it's got these industry products. Uh, we have PPR in Norway. Um, it really depends on the product. Yeah. Uh, very much. Yeah, I'm just thinking, like, I think there is a um, company here in Startup Lab that's making little kind of, it's, is it a toy? It's like a little ball? Is that yes, actually, it is. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> now they're on Lumia of Startup Lab. Mm -hmm. uh, they're called Playfinity. Playfinity. Uh, they make a, actually a consumer ball. Yeah, like a, it's a ball with a, a sensor inside which you connect your, your mobile phone mm -hmm. and you can play with your friends on it. Like, uh, throw it in the air and kick it and stuff like that and it measures every move and everything so a lot of uh, games there and that is actually made at uh, Jövik mm. uh, so that's a, a contrary example <laughs> <laughs> uh, on actually it's possible to make uh, yeah, yeah consumer play uh, electronics in Norway also um, I don't know did you work with them or do, do you know a little bit of their thought process of why they chose to make a consumer product in Norway uh, uh, I think that uh, for the uh, this 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 ball is kind of uh, it's electronic inside. It is plastic, and I believe the plastic itself is made in China, the uh, the ball. But the electronics inside is made in Norway, mm -hmm. and it's assembled again, assembled in the at the mm -hmm. uh, I think the reason uh, for making so much an assembling in Norway was that they want their they want a high quality on their first uh, series. Um, and they saw that like uh, cult wasn't that particular in Norway compared to flying back and forth to China, having a couple of agents at, at the ground of China, which you must yeah. <laughs> to help you and ensure that your factory uh, as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, uh, but maybe if they're gonna make one billion of the balls, then it'll be well, out, out, offshore. Yeah. Let's see. So just kind of moving on to something else over here. Is self-sufficiency possible? Because as we kind of, the, the basis of this is kind of coming from this place of vulnerability mm -hmm. in that companies with um, uh, factories offshore, they're kind of left in a vulnerable position. And there is a lot of talk of, oh my gosh, we need to produce this here. Yeah. Is that actually possible, or what do you interpret as self-sufficiency in terms of production? Yeah, in production, like if, if or you're... like when you're producing a, let's say, a product, a hardware product of yeah. sorts. If you make a hardware product with electronics, no, it's not possible uh, <laughs> because you need the components for from somewhere, and it's not produced in Norway, hmm. uh, and it never will. Uh, you want to, would not make a factory producing transistors or or um, uh, resistors or capacitors in Norway. 
uh, no, not never. There are huge, huge uh, factories in China making that. Um, you need uh, the raw materials for making it. Uh, the raw materials is not present in Norway for making that. Uh, so I think the world is so interconnected because of the raw materials going into, let's say you're producing an electric car, uh, you need the batteries. They're made in, even though maybe the batteries are made in, in can be made in Germany, uh, the things the batteries are made of, up of are uh, from Africa, right? Uh, so it's like, the world is so interconnected. So I don't self-sufficiency inside electronic products. No, not possible. Mm -hmm. But food, yeah, sure. <laughs> but <laughs> but that's only because our country is like it is. So for every country, no. So I think um, I don't think is there's a single country, maybe except the US and maybe China, that can be self-sufficient, like really self-sufficient, mm -hmm. uh, and still keep the um, their living standard as now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then we have another question from Ozer. Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Um, how do you see 3D automotive um, automotive manufacturing industry in Norway? 3D Kongsberg automotive. I am not yeah. entirely sure. <laughs> to be honest. Uh, yeah, well, we do a lot of car parts actually in Norway mm -hmm. uh, for BMW, especially. Um, um, Kidru was uh, producing aluminium for uh, BMW power parts, mm. uh, and it's made at Copa. It's like uh, this big uh, shield that uh, press pressure, big pressure, uh, pressure metal basically. Uh, yeah, it's regarded as to high quality again mm -hmm. uh, for premium cars. Uh, so we also see like for uh, the cost in the auto industry that Tesla is taking a whole other turn on this. They're producing everything themselves. They're even producing their uh, metal uh, parts for the GC themselves mm -hmm. and the alloy. So that's uh, like taking to the whole that other level where you're actually going, going into it because usually our car is made of, of parts from hundreds of uh, different manufacturers. Yeah. Um, Tesla is trying to everything themselves. I think that Tesla, the way of Tesla is the fully future, but somewhere around there, yeah. Uh, but still, uh, as long as you do high quality stuff mm -hmm. and people are happy with it and willing to pay, uh, absolutely, it's uh, possible to make it in the way. Yeah. But uh, he's asked about three parts. So, um, one cool thing is which coming in now is 3D printing and printing in metal. Uh, there's a company called the uh, Norsk Titan mm. or Norwegian Titanium um, Egg Moon, uh, which actually makes titanium printers. So they make uh, 3D printers that uh, uses some kind of titanium dust to uh, do a plasma beam and kind of uh, they make uh, apart layer by layer by layer by layer. Uh, mm -hmm. adding metal layer by layer by layer uh, and, uh, and they've got a rough part with this but inside the machine there's all a full CNC center so it will mill the part in perfect conditions afterwards mm -hmm. uh, and these machines are the first one uh, that was the first 3D printer uh, that was um, approved for uh, creating aeronautics or aerospace um, parts so uh, Boeing has bought 70 of them and placed them in Washington uh, and they're printing parts for airplanes, basically. So that is kind of uh, taking 3D printing to the next level, I believe. Yeah. Uh, the um, cool, yeah we can, a cool thing about this is that you can print and make stuff that's not really doable uh, on normal subtractive machining. You can do like with 3D printing, you can make pretty uh, complex uh, geometrical shapes, yeah. uh, which uh, enables you to save weight, uh, but still keep the size same strength. Interesting. Um, actually, since we're on the topic, uh, you were also involved in uh, like, yeah, during uh, when the pandemic can really hit, you were involved in helping out in with uh, creating visors for uh, health personnel. And this actually goes with the question we got here from, from Sigurd. Uh, but uh, 
if you could tell us a little bit more about the 3D printing movement uh, and uh, what you were involved in, like just a little bit of a taste of that. Yeah, yeah. when the pandemic struck, with suddenly very fast, it was clear that uh, the health workers, uh, uh, just in Norway, but all around the world, were missing, um, uh, what do you call it, this uh, smith iron suit, what do you call it in English? Um. <laughs> Yeah. It's a little bit hard. Uh, I don't know, protective gear? <laughs> protective yeah, gear, yeah. Yeah. Uh, mostly all countries in the world want protective gear. Mm. And of course, it wasn't enough protective gear in the world uh, mm. at the moment. Um, so, one guy called Henrik Ville, which was uh, at the uh, Vips, um, he started a group uh, called uh, Makers Against COVID 19. Uh, where first it called actually 3D printer makers against COVID-19. So uh, uh, we picked up an idea from um, uh, the manufacturer of the Prusa printers uh, called Josef Prusa in Czechia. Uh, they have made uh, they made a kind of a, a protective face visor. So uh, and it was at the start it was attended for um, the dentists uh, in Czechia um, because when you're a dentist you're like up in the face at people <laughs> so they wanted something to protect, protect them with so they actually he scrambled his uh, team and uh, in three days they uh, made uh, a 3d drawing uh, and tested out uh, a headband which you could um, connect a uh, overhead uh, like this old, old overhead uh, foils to uh, to protect yourself um, so uh, in the group that Hendrix uh, created, uh, I think in the start we were just 30, 40 people, and we started uh, playing around with the design of this headband. Uh, and this is the cool thing about the maker movement. I think that uh, people are sharing their 3D drawings uh, for free to everyone, so everyone else can build upon it right? and make it improve it because uh, a thousand heads uh, are better than one. Uh, so you kind of take this, uh, we thought this headband and just improve it so it was lighter, faster to print, and fit uh, into um, the hole for a A4 uh, holding machine, uh, which, which will make the production of the the way the wire itself much faster. So uh, yeah, suddenly the group was like three thousand five hundred people, and during the crisis we produced almost fifty thousand headbands. So uh, made a ordering a web where people could order. Uh, uh, so the hospitals order dentists, uh, uh, medic uh, like health workers, everyone. So we, and also there were some people uh, actually setting up a um, central where everything is mounted together uh, in Oslo. So people just printed all around Norway, sent stuff in there, and it was mounted. Uh, it was wrapped. Uh, sent out to those who needed it. So that's really very cool. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool, and I think um, <laughs> I think yeah, we're actually kind of running out of time. But I think that that is a really kind of cool initiative, and in a way, I mean, I don't know uh, in the future we're just gonna have to keep up with you and kind of see because uh, this is a great initiative. Perhaps something that I was thinking while you were mentioning this is. I wonder if this could actually be the way forward in kind of stimulating a little bit more of uh, production in Norway or making people maybe think outside the box and yeah, create an like, innovative yeah. uh, environment around that. Yeah, in a crisis time, people want to help out and mm -hmm. suddenly you're able to do that. I would just mention that it's in Oslo Science Park, the cool thing about working here and being a part of this uh, environment is that you have people from so many disciplines. So. Yeah. Uh, during the crisis, there was a guy called Sebastian at a leap. He was just walking outside the hard lab, so me printing those bands. And he had an idea for a uh, adapter which you could use in the operating room by the surgeon. So now we're working with that. Uh, I think that's cool. In this this park, there's so many different people, and everyone want to make something. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that stimulates to new ideas and uh, could be be cool forward. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much and apologies that we kind of went down for a little bit, but it's been super fun talking to you, super interesting. Thank you guys for tuning in and watching. Sorry about the little bit of a bump that we had in the road over there. Have a great lunch. We'll catch you next Thursday. Bye. Bye. <laughs>